meeting you right where you are on your foster care journey. This is The Forgotten Podcast. Hello and welcome to The Forgotten Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Cabe, and I am so happy to be with you. If you are part of the foster care community, passionate about serving, or simply interested in learning more, we are here for you. In every episode of this podcast, you're going to hear from men and women who've experienced foster care to one degree or another. They may have grown up in the system, are caseworkers, or foster parents, or other people who are here to bring you hope and encouragement. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe and share with a friend. Remember, you are not alone. I hope you enjoy the Forgotten Podcast. Well, James, the definition of sacrifice is the act of giving up something valued for the sake of something or someone else regarded as more important or worthy. And for 10 years of your life, you lived as a house parent kid. You call yourself a house parent kid at Gateway Woods. And through this experience, you saw this definition of sacrifice played out over and over again in your parents. And I'm really excited to have you on the show. We know each other personally. You're a great friend to my kids. This is just really fun for me. Um, but I want to start by giving our listeners some context. So first, just help help our listeners understand what is Gateway Woods in the first place? Sure. So Gateway Woods is going to be, I guess, um, there are three different places that kids can end up. I mean, at their parents' home, um, living a great life, they can end up in foster care. Then they can also end up in lockup, in juvenile detention. Um, And Gateway Woods is going to be a residential facility, and they're going to be somewhere in between that foster care and lockup system. So you're dealing with all of that same trauma in foster care. You're still dealing with all of that pain and that hurt Um, those broken families uh, and whatever it might be. But then it's also they're there because they've done something. They're there oftentimes it's drug abuse. They got caught either dealing drugs or using drugs. Um, Theft, truancy is a big one. A variety of behavior mismanagement. A lot of those things where they're acting out, that, that past trauma that they've experienced is going to cause them to start acting out and they're going to be in trouble with the law. Um, so it's a home where it's, it's going to be a family dynamic and it's something that I really, really appreciate about Gateway in the way that they focus on therapy, therapy, therapy. I had the mm. pleasure of being the education intern there this past uh, this past summer. And that was something that my principal kept reiterating. They have an on-site school there. He said, it is therapy first, it's therapy first, it's mm. therapy first. So with Gateway, you're dealing with all of this, um, the same things that are the, Home is unsafe. Um, you're coming from broken homes. Physical, sexual, emotional abuse is very, very, um, very present hmm. in these kids' lives. And it's heartbreaking to see. It is heartbreaking to see these kids come in and just the amount of trauma that they're working with. So what Gateway does is Gateway is really unique. In most residential homes, it's kind of like shift work where they're just the supervisor's just kind of there, person's there to make sure that nobody dies. <laughs> I mean, it's and fights don't break out and, and whatnot. Whereas Gateway, it is set up in a family of like atmosphere. And Jamie, that's something that I think is really beautiful about Gateway and in foster care and adoption is Gateway recognizes that it's not just the parents that are in the trenches. Mm. It is the entire family that is in these trenches. It's the entire family unit that is working with these kids and they get to see and they get to work with these kids, but then they also get to experience that hurt and that secondhand mm. trauma. The entire family experiences that secondhand mm. trauma yeah. in their own lives. Um, so Gateway, what it does is when a resident comes home, when a resident is accepted into the program, they're going to go work at, a, I'm going to go live at a home. They're going to be living on site at Gateway Woods. It's a 50 acre campus with a woods, with a pond, with an on-site school, with a Mm -hmm. barn, um, just a a big field, a lot of different areas that they can walk, that they can um, just have time. They they can just kind of be in nature too. Uh, Anyway, but they they live at a home. There's five homes at Gateway currently, and they live with, there's main house parents, and their main house parents are going to live in the home. There's going to be an apartment, then there's going to be an area where the residents are going to live, I never got the irony of this, but we always called it the big house <laughs> was where the, where, um, where the residents were at. And that's where life happened. Yeah. And then there's also going to be the alternates. Um, so with Gateway, my parents, we were there for 10 years. Mm. 
And every month we had about nine days off. Um, and during those nine days off, the rest of the days that we were on of the month, we were living, we were doing life with these residents. We were eating breakfast. We were eating lunch. We were um, doing school. We were working on homework. We were, there was times of crying. There was times of laughter. There was playing mm -hmm. games, going to visit family, going vacations, doing all of these different things. And again, it's designed so these residents can come and just experience that family-like atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, residents, a house can hold up to seven residents in a house and that's max capacity. Um, and that fluctuates here and there. Sometimes it's less than that. Sometimes we've had one or two residents. Sometimes, oftentimes, more often than not, we've been at max capacity mm. when my family was there. Yeah. And that was pretty normal. Um, Tell me this too, James. How how many people are in your immediate family? And so you said most times the residents, there were seven of them. How many were your, in your immediate family? So when we first moved there, there was, um, it was just myself, my sister, and that was it. Um, by the time that we left in 2013, um, there were a total of, I had four younger siblings there. Okay. So my parents were raising five wow. kids plus the additional um, seven kids that they had coming in now. Wow, that's so crazy. So with that, you have, it, 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 I, I, I look back and I'm like, mom, dad, how on earth did you do this? this is, <laughs> I have so much respect. Mm. Um, so with Gateway then too is one other thing that they create is not only that, but they also allow a lot of support for the residents. So they have this fa family therapy, or this, this family dynamic, this family unit working with these kids, but then they also have an on-site school. They have master level um, counselors that they pair every single resident with. Hmm. They have, after, at the end of placement, they can, uh, residents have the opportunity to be matched up with a mentor through LARC, linking to attain responsibility and community. Um, they can go to Willow Bridge. There's on so there's something called Gateway Farms where kids can learn this work ethic, learn to what it's like to have a job, learn what it's like to have go through an interview process, have a resume, and to be able when they go into that into the world, into the rest of the world, they kind of have that on that resume, and they can have those good recommendations so cool. and whatnot. So that's kind of in a nutshell mm -hmm. what Gateway is and kind of the people um, that that they're serving. With with Gateway, um, then too. So we have all of that past trauma, um, which we can get into a little bit later. To what extent that was, but in, so we were there from two thousand four, yeah, two thousand four to two thousand three. We left for a year and came back Wait, for a year say in two thousand fifteen. Two thousand four. I'm sorry, two thousand four to yeah. two thousand thirteen. So okay, so just start that for, start that over so it's clear. You were, so okay. say we were there from. We were there from two thousand four to 2013, then we left for a year and came back for a year in 2015. Okay. So we had a nine year stint and then a year stint, so a total of about 10 years wow. or so. And, and how uh, old were you when you started? I was four whenever wow. I came. Wow. So all of those major huh. um, developmental stages happened at Gateway, hmm. surrounded by trauma. Wow. Um, so, so you probably do you even really remember life very much before gate before being at Gateway. I have a few memories, but it's mostly from pictures and huh. what my parents have told me. Like my earliest memory that I can think of is arriving on Gateway campus. Really? Wow. Yeah. Well, and something that you told me before and you shared before is how you over and over you saw your parents live out sacrifice through this and um, you use those words like I saw this and I saw that and I saw this and there's that common saying that says more is caught than taught and I think that from I mean we're going to find out that that's that was very true in your story I want you to tell us some of the ways that you saw sacrifice lived out in your parents during this time sure sure absolutely um so with with my parents coming in you're dealing with all of this trauma you're dealing with these residents have horrendous things in their life. Um, so my parents started in 2005, they started the pregnant teen program. So I don't know how they did it. They were raising kids. They were raising um, troubled teens. And then they were also developing a whole new program for Gateway that's still in use today. Wow. I'm just like, I was blown away by the number of things that my parents did. Um, but we had residents come in where they're growing up in meth labs, they're growing up in, um, there's sexual abuse that there was a resident one time. Um, and 
I forgot to mention um, that due to confidentiality, the names have been changed. Sure. Um, okay, great. Just due to that. Um, but anyway, but there was a girl named Latrice where she came and her dad actually sold her into prostitution so he could purchase drugs. Hmm. Um, so that type, those types of things just break your heart. Hmm. Um, and I saw my parents choose to love day in and day out. They saw this trauma. This, I mean, trauma does not have, I mean, trauma has very severe ramifications. Um, and they're going, it's going to manifest itself in your life. So you have residents acting out. You have residents that are going to just sit and refuse. They're going to spit in their face. That are going to um, run away. That are going to threaten them suicide. That are going to day in and day out choose to say, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Hmm. Um, and parent, the residents, the average stay is be, right now six to nine months. It used to be a year to two years. Hmm. So you have a resident come in and they complete the program. They start to do well. You kind of um, see the steady slope where they start to increase and do better. And then they leave. And then you get another resident and you start back to square one. Hmm. So with that, my parents, we worked with over 100 kids during that time. We had 100 kids come through our house, 100 kids come through our family. Hmm. And every single time you're starting back at square one. Yeah. Every single time my parents are starting back and saying, you're coming from trauma. You're coming from pain. Our family's recognizing hmm. you're coming from pain. You're coming from trauma. I know you're going to sit and scream at my face and say, you hate me. I know you're going to say here, say how you don't want to be here and how you're manipulating the system, how there are horrendous things. I had to my face, a resident come up to me and say that they hate me. Um, hmm. And as a kid, that just does awful things. Um, yeah. And so with that, though, I saw my parents day in and day out. They were exhausted. They were tired. They were burnt out. But every day they chose to say, I'm going to get up and I'm going to love. I'm going to get up and I'm going to spend my day with these residents. I'm going to choose to listen to them. I'm going to choose to give them patience. I'm going to choose to give them the time of day. And whenever, because one thing with trauma, one thing with this is every single resident has had people push them away time and time and time again. So whenever you have a family loving on them, it just, mm -hmm. it doesn't compute. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit into their, um, this story that they've built in their head of how the world works. Yeah. So when somebody's showing them love, they do everything they can to push them away. And it keeps ratcheting up higher and higher and higher. Hmm. And my parents are like, we have to push through with this. We have to show these residents that somebody, it is possible to love them. There was a book that I read, Kisses from Katie, but there was a really good quote in there where she's like, how can they know the love of Christ if they don't even know what love is? Hmm. And I saw my parents demonstrate and saying, we want to teach them that there is a loving God, that there is a loving father in heaven. And we need to demonstrate that and let God's love shine through us. Hmm. And so my parents, whenever they laid down their life, they laid down every aspect of their lives. My family laid down every aspect of our lives. Um, we were giving over, whenever you're inviting them into your family, when you're doing foster care, mm -hmm. they, it's not like they're just coming over for dinner and right. then they leave. Yeah. It's you're doing life with them. We were, they were involved in Sunday school. They were involved in Sunday school trips. They were involved in vacations. They were involved in mm -hmm. breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the school bus, the schools, the teachers, um, church, they were at family. That was one thing as um, a kid that was really hard is whenever mm. residents called grandma, grandpa, grandma, grandpa. Hmm. I was just like, that's another thing that that's not mine. That's not yours. Um, wow. And homework time. I mean, hmm. siblings, aunts, uncles, sharing parents. You're doing life with them. You're giving over everything to them because that's what they need. And that's what Christ hmm. calls you to do. Yeah. And talk about what it was like. I mean, you mentioned a little bit how it was hard not having your parents as your own. But what was it like, um, let's go specifically, when you would see these kids like yell hateful things at your parents or spit in their faces or just do things that you're like, that is not fair. What was that like for you as a kid? I don't think I quite fully understood it as a kid. Mm, um, sure. And I'm sorry if I, this is still very raw. Mm. Um it is really painful. Hmm. It is incredibly painful. When you have a resident, we had a resident, um, Bethany, where she would just sit 
and scream. We had a resident LaTanya that she would just yell. Um, she would scream profanities at my parents. Mm. And as a kid, you're thinking, I have given over so much to you. I have given my family. I have given Sunday school. I have given you my time. This, the love that my parents would typically be giving to me, that time mm. to be able to work on math, on science, mm. on English, they have to spend with you because you're throwing a tantrum in the hallway. And mm. for you to just throw that away and to slap them in the face, not only are they in some ways throwing away the things that my siblings and I had given to them freely, Mm. But they're also treating my parents, the people that we loved, hmm. horrifically and awful. Um, and Jamie, I'm going to be honest, it caused a lot of bitterness growing up. Mm -hmm. um, that there were periods in my life where I bitterly, bitterly hated Gateway. I bitterly, mm. bitterly hated residents because I'm like, people would come up and talk about residents. When people would talk about foster kids, I'm like, why? Why are we supporting them? They're just going to walk away and they're going to turn their turn their face away. Yeah. They're going to just reject everything. Um, so it, it wasn't easy. And that's something that, I mean, I've talked with other house parent kids too. Like it's, it's hard. Mm. Um, you can sometimes grow callous to it. And by the grace of God and by the goodness of God, he's changed my heart to absolutely mm. adore gateway mm. and to love gateway, but to also recognize that we can't shy away from the hurt that mm. families go through. We need to recognize that secondhand trauma is a real thing yeah. um, and being living and growing up in trauma when those are the foundational years of growing into the person that you are. Hmm. The kids, the biological kids of foster parents, the biological kids of house parents really need support, hmm. um, really need a lot of help. Actually, I was talking with an assistant here recently, and one thing they said was, You'd think that one of the hardest parts of working at Gateway would be residents, but one of the hardest parts is working with house parent kids. Mm -hmm. um, because in that, you see your parents giving over all of this time and energy. So whenever you come home, whenever I come home from school, mm -hmm. um, I might need help with math, but Tiara is suicidal, Deja's cutting herself, and Jada's in complete refusal. Mm -hmm. And those things, those needs must be met at that time. Those needs have to be met. And if that happened one or a few days out of the week, that'd be fine. But that's happening day in and day out every day. And whenever you have a resident complete the program and coming in, you're starting back at day one. Hmm. This is happening every day for 10 years. And it gets to be um, it, exhausting. It gets to be really hard. And so house parent kids are, so this assistant was like, they don't always get the attention that they need. Mm -hmm. um, biological kids of foster parents don't always get the attention that they need. And that's something that needs to be recognized. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can be forgotten a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's why I'm really happy to have you on today because I think that um, although it can, it's very sobering and I think it's very important for us to recognize, um, we're going to find there's also a lot of hope, um, which is just very, hope. very exciting. What was it like for you when, like you said that time, someone screamed, I hit you right in your face um, and generally were you getting kids, you know, acting out or being rude or things towards you? Was it mostly towards your parents? Um, I'm asking you a lot of questions in one. My, my main question is what was it like for you if you felt it personally attacking you? Um, so at gateway you encounter those things sometimes. So you have to learn to not take things personally. Mm. Um, get some thick was, skin. You get to learn some thick skin, <laughs> yes. I mean, there are things that will still hurt. Sure. But um, there are definitely things where I'm just like, okay, I'm going to move on with my life. <laughs> um, it was mostly towards my parents because we're viewed as kind of a peer. Mm. You're kind of viewed as a house parent kid. You're viewed as a sibling. Yeah. You're not doing logs. You're not evaluating the residents on their behavior. Mm. Um, you're also not viewed... So in foster care, I think you'd know this too, of siblings are very tight knit um, and very close. And so as a sibling growing up with these residents, you become sibling like mm, sure. with a lot of the residents. Um, we had some residents, while there has been times where it was very, it cut very, very deep. Mm. Um, 
it was mostly, there wasn't a lot that happened directly to my face. It was more so on the outside looking in where it was like secondhand of yeah. like, I gave you this. Why are you not, why are you rejecting this? Why are you walking away from this? Yeah. Um, so that, but there was still like the times when I became a sibling. There yeah. was a resident where it was um, like Maniqua. I, she called me her little brother. I was like eight at the time. And we would play, there's a pool table down in the basement. And I don't know how many times a week we would play pool. It was, it seems like every day hmm. where we just, we were able to talk. We were able to just spend time together. It wasn't necessarily deeply spiritual. It wasn't necessarily <laughs> anything where we were talking about theology, like predestination or the meaning <laughs> yeah. of life. But <laughs> we were, it was a time just to be kids. Yeah. I mean, she was 16, the average age for a resident is 16 years old. The average mm. age for a teen mom was 16 years old. You're, wow. you're doing that time where these residents, they're coming in where we had maybe four teen moms and are a pregnant teen. And they're six, you start doing the math. They're 12, 13, 14 years old when they've had these kids, when they got pregnant, there was a girl, wow. um, her name was uh, Kylie, where she was 15 years old. No, she was 14 years old and had a one-year-old. You do the math. She was 12 years old when she became pregnant. Oh, wow. These are kids that you're working yeah, with. Yeah, they're kids. Um, so we had a, another girl where, uh, Chris Lynn, where she was, I was a bit older at the time. I think I was 12 or 13. Um, and we were just great friends. Hmm. So yes, there was a lot of hurt, but mm -hmm. there was also a lot of good just to be siblings mm. with each other. Yeah. Um, to kind of demonstrate again, that family dynamic. I think what was hard, though, as a parent, while we're creating this family dynamic, is to see the residents' families reject them. Mm -hmm. um, so in working at Gateway, and that's one thing that is, it's like you, well, I, I'll get into that later. I need to restart. Okay, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> um, in working, working with these residents and becoming a family, it's hard to see when their own families reject them mm. and hurt them. There were, with the hundred families that we worked with or over hundred families that we worked with, two, two of the um, kids grew up in two parent homes, mm. two of them. And one of those parents, um, the dad smoked weed all day and didn't have a job. And when my parents found that out and brought it to court, mm. they were out of the picture and didn't care. Mm. Um, there was some other residents, um, Morgan, she had a scar on her forehead because her dad had beat her over the head with a two by four and he was in jail at that time. Mm. And all she talked about was how much she loved her dad. Mm. And you see that and you're just like, what mm. on earth? How do you process that? How do you handle that? There was another resident, um, Nia. Um, that she had, her parents were bitterly, bitterly divorced to the mm -hmm. point they couldn't even sit in the same room. So residents would come to court. They would um, go to court with their counselor. They would go to court with some foster care, uh, their caseworker, and with the house parents. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a time to be able to say, hey, this resident, she's um, doing well. They're doing well. They can go back home. They can go back and live mm -hmm. with their parents. And there's a time for their parents to prove to the judge, to prove to the court that they're healing, that they're doing better. But Nia's parents were so bitterly divorced. They had to sit on opposite ends of the courtroom because they would scream at each other mm -hmm. and both had to have security sit next to them. Wow. And you have residents where um, they were just bitter and angry. But Nia, the one thing that she had on her bulletin board was a picture of her parents together when she was a little girl. Hmm. And we sit here and we say, oh, I mean, Divorce is not going to affect the kids. Mm. Where these broken homes, it's just about us. Jamie, it heavily, heavily affects these kids. And it is so traumatizing whenever, and it's so hard to see a resident sit by a window day in and day out waiting for this past to come up and parents don't show up. Family doesn't show mm. up. When you say past, you're meaning like a visit time with yeah. their parents? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So as um, kids, as the residents um, progress through the program, um, they can start to do day passes with their parents and they can go on um, home passes and they can go on weekend passes. It's the purpose is to get them integrated back 
into their family. That end goal is to get them integrated back with their family hmm. um, and to have um, that that healing. Gateway's mission is to honor and obey God, providing um, help and healing to troubled children and families who may then bless others. Um, Gateway wants to bring that restoration yeah. back to families. Um, so, and seeing that, seeing those broken families, it it was one thing that I had to sit back and I had to realize how blessed I was that my parents at the end of the day loved me. Yeah. That when a resident would mm. talk about how they don't understand what a loving father is, they don't understand what a loving God is, mm. that I could sit back and I said, could say, God, thank you so much because I will never know what it means to face that rejection from a parent. Mm. I will never know what it means to have a father beat me. All I will ever know as a father that loves me and that cares for me and treasures me and spends time with me. He might not be perfect, mm. but he demonstrates that he loves me and is a beautiful example of who God is. Yeah. So when when were you able to kind of reconcile that? Because obviously there's also the, you, you said you saw the strain on your parents, you saw the exhaustion, you saw the times, I'm guessing if your parents are anything like, us <laughs> that there's when you're exhausted and you come up asking for something and we might snap back at you and you know like those are the hard times for kids right when you're like listen I just want I just want some time um, but you saw that and you struggled bitterness towards the kids that the residents that were there um, did you ever struggle with bitterness towards your parents um not anything directly it was mostly towards the residents. I think mm -hmm. the way that it might have manifested itself is there was a period of time when my parents and I were a bit disconnected. Mm. Um, when they was just kind of, they were there living their life and I would leave after breakfast at eight o'clock and go play with my friends mm. around campus and then wouldn't come home until eight o'clock. Mm. Um, so when that happened every night during summer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it wasn't so much bitterness. I, would, I guess I wouldn't say, I wouldn't, directly have said it was bitterness, mm -hmm. but I would say more so just disconnect. Yeah. And so when do you feel like it, it started to reconcile where you like, just like what you were talking about now is you're like, wow, I do know that my parents love me though. They're certainly not perfect. And I maybe wish they had chosen a different path. Um, but the perspective that you have now, when did that kind of come for you? It wasn't necessarily, a distinct moment. Sure. That makes sense. Um, it was God had to slowly work on my heart. Mm. Um, God slowly took me in and said, Hey, let's shift this. Let's shift this thought. So I would say probably over the past, um, shortly after gateway, probably about 2016 or so okay. was whenever my heart started to shift. Um, it was gradual and it was slow, but honestly, I'm thankful that God took it slow mm. because he was able to pry out and to be able to work on those different things. I'm saying, Hey, you see that bitterness, James? Let's work on that. Hmm. You see that hatred, James? Let's work on that. Let's bring that to the table. You hmm. see that past trauma? Let's work on that. And here recently, I mean, I started counseling, hmm. which, and that's one thing too of like, as for house parent kids, for um, foster kids, like don't shy away from counseling. Don't shy away from support yeah. and help because it's, we can't live in this bubble of thinking, oh, everything's hunky-dory and it'll be perfect and fine and we don't right. need help. Like God's going to put you in this bubble. That's not right. how that works. Right. Um, and so God's been faithful in hmm. that. And good in that. Mm, that's so cool. How would you say that growing up in this world, being a house parent kid has shaped and influenced your life today? Oh my goodness. Do you have six hours? <laughs> <laughs> I would say people will ask me and people will question, was Gateway hard? Did Gateway ruin you? Mm. And my answer isn't Absolutely. It was hard. Hmm. And Gateway ruined me. <laughs> Gateway ruined me for Christ. Hmm. I don't want, I didn't ever grow up in this normal life. I never grew up in this life of having two and a half, I mean, my parents having two and a half kids with a nice, easy um, income with a picket fence and a dog and a nice house and kind hmm. of showing up to mission trips every once in a while. Hmm. That's not, that wasn't life. It was, we were in the trenches. We were working with trauma. We were working with pain. We were working with hurt. Um, there was a sermon here recently from one of our ministers back at, in Leo. And he had a quote that I really, really liked. It's like, sometimes in American Christianity, we ask to be the hands and feet of Christ. 
but we don't want to be the scarred hands and feet of Christ. Mm. And I saw my parents accept those scars. I saw my family. I saw myself accept those scars and say, no, this isn't what God calls us to do. This isn't what God doesn't call us to easy life. He doesn't want us to have an easy life. Missions is not easy. Missions won't be easy because you're working with people to say when the going is seems to be impossible to choose to love anyway, that you're recognize you're going to get scarred. You're going to hurt, get hurt. It's going to be painful. But at the same time, God promises to walk with you every step of the way. And he manifests himself so much, even when he doesn't necessarily seem like he's there, Mm. he's holding you on tight. He's caring for you. And so with that, um, growing up in this area of my life was sacrificed. Our family was just kind of sacrificed. That became normal to me. Mm. So whenever we left Gateway, it was almost while there was a time of like reconciliation with that, my family was also a little bit like a what are we going to do with our life now? Yeah. There was a part missing where we wanted to be getting back into the trenches. We wanted to be doing something. We wanted to be pouring into others. And that's actually really common amongst hmm. a lot of house parents is house parents. Whenever they left gateway, a lot of house parents went into foster care. A lot of hmm. foster, um, house parents went to mentor future residents, house parent kids, a lot of house parent kids are going into behavioral therapy, into counseling. Mm. I, my sister and I are going into teaching, working at Gateway, some sort of uh, social work, uh, foster care, adoption, some sort of human services working with trauma. Hmm. Um, wow. And that is beautiful to see. God. Yes, there's pain. Absolutely. I'm not going to deny that. Um, there are things I'm like, yeah, I kind of wish that changed a little bit. Mm-hmm. But God used it and God redeemed it in beautiful and incredible ways. And something I say, I mean, I'll tell like future fo- I mean, foster parents or uh, foster kids of like, yeah, it's hard, but God uses it in incredible ways. You're not going to have a normal life. Say goodbye to your American Christian life. <laughs> say hello to an incredible life of serving with Christ. And that is so beautiful. And your relationship with Christ will only grow. Mm. And as a kid, you see your parents choosing to say, there are lost people out there and I'm going to plunge into the thick of it because I believe in scripture. I believe that there's a judgment day coming. I believe that there are people that are lost that, and I'm going to put um, money where my mouth's at, or I'm going to have rubber hit the road, whatever mm-hmm. phrase you want to use. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to jump head over, I mean, head in. <laughs> yeah. Wow. James, every, I mean, so much of what you're saying is like hitting me. Like I'm feeling emotional <laughs> because it's just living the life is hard. Yeah. And so hearing it from a kid's perspective is encouraging to me. So I appreciate it. Um, okay. So I want you, before we close out, to speak to other kids like you, other house parent kids, other kids, biological kids of foster families, other kids who are living with um, parents who are living like missionally, like bringing people into their home, doing the hard stuff. Um, What encouragement can you give? Just speak directly to other kids like you. It's okay to not be okay. Hmm. It's okay to recognize that it's hard. Um, I get it. It's painful. Um, that there are days that you just want to throw your head up against a wall, that there are days that you just want to scream and Mm -hmm. vent and yell and say, God, why are you here? Mom and dad, why are we here? Because Mm -hmm. they don't care and nothing's going to change. Um, And there are going to be times when people will come up to you and say, oh, but you shouldn't hurt. Think of all the good that you're doing. Mm. And that hurts too. Yeah. Um, Seek support. Seek out those. Um, I've gone to other house parent kids that will talk. I have a really great relationship with my sister that will talk. It's okay to say when things hurt. It's okay to talk to your parents about when experiences hurt. Um, get counseling. I'm in counseling 
and it helped tremendously because it there's a lot of trauma there. There's a lot of hurt there. There's a lot of pain there. Um, some stuff that I'm still walking through, some stuff that I'm still sorting out. And that's okay, and that's good. Hmm. Um, you're not alone. God didn't design missions to be alone. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, and if you don't mind me saying, too, one thing, I, as I was thinking about, we talk about supporting families. We talk about supporting them. And I think a practical example is foster families, adoption, fa adoptive families, um, parents, house parents at Gateway, whatever it might be, they are giving over their time. They are giving over their life. They're giving over everything. So one way to support them is to give them your time. Mm. When we had volunteers come in the summer, I cannot tell you how amazing it was but my parents saw how volunteers out there um, landscaping, weeding, mm -hmm. working on things around the house, painting. Because it was one less thing that my parents had to think about. Mm -hmm. It was one less thing that they had to process and have say, okay, this needs to be done, this needs to be done, this needs to be done. And instead what they could do is focus on the time with the residents. Mm -hmm. but they could also focus on time with their own biological kids. And some, that's something that I saw then too is – they might not even been spending that much more time with us as kids, but it was, you could see them there. You could mm -hmm. see it. They, when they were reading the um, scripture, when they were reading a book, when they were playing a game, when we were watching a movie, when we were having conversation, because they didn't have all of those extra things running through their head, um, that they could spend time with us mm -hmm. and they could show just that they love the residents, that they could love their own biological kids as well. Um, so if you aren't in the foster care system, but know someone's in the foster care system, they would be so thankful for whatever time that you could give them. I don't care what it is, even if it's doing dishes, even if it's cleaning the house, whatever yeah. it might be, not only will they, will the parents be thankful, but the kids will be incredibly thankful as well. Um, and that's really important too. And the best thing you can do is pray. Um, I think that was sometimes really hard too. like parents, people would pray for my parents and be like, I'm here too. <laughs> I mean, it's just, yeah, yeah. um, so pray for the family, know the kids by name, know the foster kids, know the biological kids of the foster parents, um, show them love when volunteers came out and there was something called kids camp hmm. and they spent time a day with the house parent kids. Hmm. It was attention that we got. It was attention that we got got to get. And we craved that. We lo looked forward to that every, every week. Hmm. Wow. That's huge. So. I think how you said praying for, like how you said you can feel forgotten often, you know, yeah. because the, your needs don't feel as urgent perhaps, <laughs> right? In the moment. And so I also think what you said about, um, when people take off some of the burden of the parents, <laughs> that the your parents then can have their brain cleared up for you. Um, and I think that's so beautiful. I think that's really important for us to hear um, because it's it's not a big, it doesn't seem like a big thing. So you're like, oh, I don't need to help in that way. No, it's a big thing. It's huge. It is huge. Yeah, that's cute. That's wonderful. Um, James, I also would love you to speak to the parents who are living sacrificially and who maybe are also struggling with feeling like they are ruining their kids or worried that they are, you know, messing up their family. You know, parents are also have these same sorts of questions like, why did I do this? <laughs> so speak directly to the parents now, will you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it can be hard. I mean, you're creating a dysfunctional family. You're bringing in the very kids that you don't want your kids hanging out with at school. I mean, you're bringing them into your family. And it, in the moment, it can seem insane. It can seem crazy. Um, first and foremost is we serve a really good God. Mm. We serve a beautiful God that is full of redemption. And let me ask you a question. Do you want kids to live and to live this American dream? Or do you want your kids to live in the mission field and to truly love God 
and to see you demonstrating that you truly love God. And that's beautiful because as a kid, I don't want an American dream. I want a heart. I, I want a life that's serving God wherever it might take me, no matter where I go. Um, and talking to your kids and showing them love, um, just as you show foster kids love, take your kids out on daddy daughter dates, your mom son dates, um, give them individual time, um, spend time with them, play games with them. It doesn't have to be any more, or any less, but just show them mm -hmm. that just as much as your foster kids are part of your family, your biological kids are part of your family. Mm -hmm. Everyone is part of your family equally and everyone equally requires that love. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes recognizing that, and as a kid, I had to recognize this too. And my parents had to recognize this. And this was beautiful to see. But sometimes you're going to have a blown placement. Oftentimes we have blown placements. At Gateway, I can't tell you how many times, there were many residents that came back that became Christians that came back and said, I love Jesus and my life has been turned around. And there were there are story after story after story of mm -hmm. that. And that keeps you going. But there's also the majority of stories that residents you'll never hear back from again. Mm -hmm. You find out they were in an accident. They died of gang violence. They were back at home. They're back at Gateway. But my parents, even though they saw that, even though kids would end up back, they still chose to love. Hmm. And something as I think about that, as something as I think about how my parents reconciled with that, I think back to Christ of how he handled things, of with the 10 lepers. Last time I checked, Christ is all-knowing. Christ knew the future. <laughs> He's kind of God. Thank, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> thankfully, yes. But when those 10 lepers came and asked, and they, Christ healed all 10 of them, he knew that only one was going to return. He knew that only one was going to be grateful. That's recorded. Hmm. But he still chose to heal all 10. And that's something that my parents recognized. That's something that my siblings had to recognize. Hmm. That, yeah, this resident might not come back. But when God says to give over all, God's he's even meaning, hey, give over this expectation that you're going to see this fruit grow, that you're going to see this harvest. Because that harvest, it's mine. That seed, it's mine. That field, it's mine. It's not yours. Give it over to me. Hmm. And recognizing that I'm not even going to love for the hope of seeing this harvest. I'm going to love. My parents are going to love because that's what God calls us to do. Hmm. And that's what he demonstrated. And that's when it's beautiful. And so as a foster kid, I'm mean, sorry, as a foster parent, to demonstrate that to your kids, to show that, to say, this is what Christ's love looks like. This is what laying down your life looks like. Hmm. It's beautiful and it's amazing and Jamie if I could have a tenth a tenth of the love and the sacrifice and the grace that my parents had hmm. I would be just sitting pretty they had so much love they had so much compassion and you might be think you're ruining your kids' life but all you're doing is you're ruining this American dream hmm. you're ruining this comfortable Christianity and setting a stage of what sacrifice looks like and that's that's beautiful mm, that is so beautiful and james i'm gonna ask you this final question i know it's actually not a question um but i want you to pretend instead of myself it's your parents sitting here next to you and i want you to <laughs> say thank you to them or whatever you want to say to them i think i'm gonna cry um <laughs> Mom, Dad, thank you so much for demonstrating day in and day out what sacrifice and love looks like. You never had to sit down and have a conversation about sacrifice. You never had to sit down and have a conversation about love because you showed it to me every day of my life. And I know that there have been times that it's been hard, but I am so thankful for the both of you in everything that you did. And I would not be who I am today without either of you. Hmm. That's awesome. James, thank you so much. I feel like an emotional wreck. 
<laughs> I did too. So. <laughs> um, but I think that this will speak to a lot of our listeners and be an encouragement and a challenge and just a really great reminder of why we do what we do and this, what we're called to do. You know, this is, we're here on earth for this reason. We are not here yes. to live the American dream like you've said so beautifully. So thank you for being on the show today and I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Jamie. It was, it was an honor and I pray that God can use this use these words for his glory alone. Well, I hope today's episode was an encouragement to you wherever you are on this foster care journey. Now, we want you to stay connected, so be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode. Also, we have a ton of great content for you over at theforgotteninitiative.org. Thank you for watching, and I can't wait to see you next time.